what is the aim and scope of my lecture? So again, as I said, I will be talking about far right parties. And um, why do I talk about far right parties? Because uh, they have been, um, they, 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 they have been obviously uh, steadily expanding um, in the European uh, scene uh, for, for years now. And we want to, you know, what I'm gonna do is, I will give you some background information about them, yes, but what I really want to do is I want to talk about the literature that studies them, okay? Because I think that a lot of our perceptions of our, um, you know, uh, uh, on these parties, on these movements are shaped by what we are exposed to, you know, our personal experience to, you know, far right parties or immigrants and so forth. Uh, or, as well as what we read about them. So this is why I'm, I'm gonna be going over uh, the literature about them as well. And um, I want to also discuss uh, the impact of the, uh, you know, uh, the impact of far right parties, again in Europe, and how they approach the topic of immigration. Okay, so, um, so this is something, uh, this is going to be one of the major uh, points about my discussion. And as we can see here, uh, the rise of uh, far right right parties is not just, you know, is not just uh, limited to one region or uh, one portion of a country. As you can see, um, far right has been on the rise uh, pretty much throughout Europe. Okay. And uh, even though this part, uh, you know, this, this uh, picture does not include countries um, like Turkey, I would say that the far right, far right, uh, far right movement is also has also been on the rise in Turkey in the sense that uh, one of the uh, one of the partners of the current government, uh, you know, Nationalist Action Party, Media uh, Hareket Partisi, is considered uh, to be an extreme right movement in the literature. Okay, so the literature, you know, considers this party to be a far right ultra nationalist party, it puts it under the umbrella of far right movements, and, um, and it is currently um, in charge of the government alongside with the uh, ruling AKP justice and development party in Turkey so uh, we can also I think add Turkey to this picture, in addition to the European, you know, the rest of the European countries out there. So let's see if I can click this hold on move. For some reason, hmm. I okay now. Yes, now it clicks. So again, we will be going over the contemporary issues and academic debates in the field. And uh, finally, I want to discuss a little bit about the future course of these studies on far right movements. Um, and um, here, a bunch of pictures. Uh, you have the meeting of far right leaders in Prague in December 2017. So that's quite a few number of people there representing different countries. And on the left side, you see a bunch of um, you know people sympathizers um, that are joined uh, to give their support to these parties. Now, as I said earlier, oops, why do I hold on? Yes. So um, now, before I proceed any further, just a little uh, word on left and right. So um, what are these terms? Where do they come from? If you have taken a course on political theory, you probably uh, went over this. But for those people who forgot about it or who haven't taken a, such a course, uh, let's, you know, let's have, uh, let's say, let's remind ourselves about this term. So um, this, these terms, left and right, appeared during the French Revolution in 1789. So at the time, uh, the supporters of the monarchy uh, said to the right of the president of the assembly, the National Assembly that gathered um, you know, during the revolution, and, um, and, and the, 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 the ones that were revolutionary who didn't want to have anything to do with, let's say, uh, monarchy, sat on the right and on, on the left of the president of the National Assembly. Um, even at the time, by the way, this was considered as a divisive move. So uh, there were critiques of the sitting plan saying um, this was creating polarization among uh, these people that they should be able to discuss uh, their views, uh, not based on, you know, uh, not by getting divided into camps, 
uh, but by, you know, as individuals, you know, discussing whatever they had to discuss with themselves. So this gives you, gives you an idea of the, if you will, the problematic nature of these terms in the first place. So um, what about far right movements on the immigration waves? Uh, yesterday, Muge uh, talked about this in some detail and Paolo in his lecture also discussed, um, you know, the immigration waves and so forth. So I'm not gonna go over this, you know, in a lot of detail. So I'm not gonna give you, you know, a lot of numbers and stuff there. Uh, but basically we're gonna be, you know, all I'm gonna say here is that uh, the, especially the war in Syria, which began back in 2011, acted as a catalyst uh, for the so-called refugee crisis that came to influence, um, you know, European countries as well as its, its neighbors. And one of the consequences of this crisis was that um, the far-right parties uh, took this as an opportunity to adopt increasingly negative tone against all kinds of immigration and immigrants, okay? Um, so it wasn't just a humanitarian crisis, but it also had a deep, political consequences, if you will. So um, here, um, I would like to uh, make a very um, technical distinction, but I think this is important. Okay, so I want to clarify myself. Um, in this, as you know, in my presentation, I use the terms refugees, immigrants interchangeably. Actually, this is not technically correct. I would like you to be very careful about this because international organizations like UNHCR refuse this. They say that these are, you know, these, these, you know, words have different meanings, they have different definitions, they have different applications, and you cannot mix and match them. Okay, uh, so they're not, they're not the same thing. When you're referring to an immigrant versus, you know, an asylum seeker, for instance, you're not necessarily talking about the same thing. And then, you know, why do I then use them interchangeably in my discussion. Is this because I'm neglecting this distinction or I'm disdainful of this distinction? No, it's just that I'm doing this for purely practical reasons. Uh, I'm assuming that most of you folks do not have a background in law. I certainly don't. And you have to understand that the political science literature that I'm versed in, the one that I'm mostly using, um, they, they, they're, they are also using these terms interchangeably without making any distinctions. Some, this has also something to do with the fact that most lay people, you know, just people on the street um, wouldn't know the, the, this, you know, the difference between the two. And so when they're responding to, to those people, you know, known as refugees or immigrants, they're pretty much putting them all into the same basket. Okay, and uh, politicians tend to do this as well. Uh, be, you know, for one reason or another. As a result, um, they're, they're used interchangeably. Um, many times um, the, the, the terms refugee and immigrants um, used interchangeably in political science literature, as well as by politicians, as well as by lay people. I'm not saying that this is, uh, you know, the correct approach, or I'm not saying that the distinctions aren't important. But because I'm talking about the responses of regular people, just people who are not necessarily experts in this field, just average Joe, if you will, this is why I also use the terms interchangeably. And finally, let's not forget that in some countries like such as my country, Turkey, uh, the legal status of these people uh, who leave their homes for one or, or another reason uh, to come to our country, uh, their legal status is not clear. It's, it's in a limbo uh, for a bunch of reasons that I'm not gonna get into. So this is another reason why you know, I'm using them interchangeably in this uh, presentation. So, you know, this is actually uh, problematic because I already told you that I'm gonna use these terms interchangeably, far right parties. I already use the terms extreme right, far right. Sometimes I will refer to them as populist what's going on? I'm using too many terms, you know, I mean, I mean, are they also interchangeable? Are they, I mean, how do we even define them? I mean, how do we define a far right party, extreme right party or so forth? You know, what are they? How are we going to do this? So um, one thing um, that we can say uh, regarding uh, the literature based on, you know, based on the literature review of an influential author in our field of, you know, in this, you know, immigration uh, studies on far-right uh, parties, Cass Mudd, 
um, says that the right wing extremism is a form of ideology. And as such, you know, um, it, it is, a, let's say, a spectrum. And therefore, it causes a lot of ideological debate. Okay. And he actually, in that same study, came up with 26 definitions for right wing extremist politics, like 26 definitions. That's, you know, that's quite a lot when you think about it. And then he also figured out that there were 58 distinct characteristics brought up to, to let's say, characterize right-wing extremist politics. That's also quite a lot. But then he also figured out that there are five characteristics, he said, uh, that, uh, you know, uh, that's, that, that come and stand out at least half of the literature. And what are those? He said, those are nationalism, racism, xenophobia, anti-democracy, and strong state. So those are five, let's say, keywords that you know, uh, many of these studies used to describe um, these, um, the, these parties or right-wing extremist uh, movement in the West. I am clicking and again, it's not for some reason. Yes, it's working. So um, in addition to this, he also talks about nativism authoritarianism, which is related to the strong state argument, okay, that he just gave in the previous slide, and populism, as also he said. So what is exactly nativism? What do I mean by nativism? Nativism, in a nutshell, is this idea that the native inhabitants in a place, wherever they are, uh, their interests, their, they, they, whatever they have, they, they proceed, they, they are prioritized, at the expense of those you know, people who are considered as outsiders. And by outsiders, they mostly mean immigrants, okay? And um, this is why a lot of uh, these movements also will have the xenophobia characteristic in them. So um, here is, um, I, I tried to keep this uh, lecture also a little bit lighthearted. So there's this you know, lady standing there, Englishman, where are you? So, um, you know, in response to this lady, I would say we will be answering her question, well, in a way, um, in a couple of slides later. So hang on with me. Um, there was this research um, done by Pew um, Research uh, Center, um, and uh, this was done undertaken on right-wing populist parties in Europe in 2019. And they asked uh, three, on three issues, uh, they asked public, they went for the public opinion and um, it gave kind of interesting results that I want to share with you briefly. So the first one is people with a favorable view of right-wing populist parties in Europe tend to be less happy with the EU. So one of the characteristics of right-wing populist parties is that they really dislike EU, okay? As you can see, you know, this doesn't matter whether they're located in Germany, which is at the top, or Greece uh, at the bottom with Syriza, the representative, as you can see, um, many, uh, you know, uh, almost um, all of them um, are, have, have this, uh, you know, they're, they're not necessarily uh, happy with the presence of EU uh, when asked. The second one has to do with the supporters of many European populist parties expressing more negative views of Muslims in their country. So it seems like Muslims uh, have become the scapegoats of um, these movements. Uh, you know, pretty much uh, most of them have negative views of Muslims uh, that are, uh, you know, who, are, who reside in their country. So they have a prejudice, I would say. And finally, the backers of populist parties in Europe often express more confidence of Putin on world affairs. I think this is rather interesting uh, for those uh, people who are joining us today uh, from Russia. Um, so I guess, I guess um, these, these parties, for one reason or another, uh, they really support uh, President Putin's uh, politics, okay? uh, which is interesting. Okay, so having stated that we had all these different definitions, they do, you know, as I have seen, you know, shown you in the previous slide, they have certain opinions, these you know, parties. 
So, but again, you know, we go back to square one. How are we going to define these countries? If we're, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, these parties. If they're going, if we're going to, you know, study them. First of all, we have to, you know, delineate them. We have to figure out what they are, who they are. Okay. And um, here, as I said, there are lots of discussions um, in the field. So um, one of the authors stated that whatever categorizations were out there in the literature, you know, back in 2003, he says that these are no longer applicable and extreme, you know, when you're referring to this umbrella, if you're putting extreme right and fascist parties under the same umbrella, he said, this is misleading. They require separate categorization. You can't just chuck in all the um, parties in there, you know, and into the same basket and expect that that they they belong to the same category. And then, um, you know, some years later, Von Spagna said that uh, you know we need to distinguish between far right parties and anti immigration parties for methodological accuracy. So, in other words, he said that far right parties are not necessarily equal to anti immigration parties. Um, they're not. They're not identical. And finally, uh, later Messina said that subcategorizations are not functional. We need to stick with loose definitions. Um, they're better, they're sufficient. So, you know, go figure. Um, you could go either way, I guess, if you're gonna define um, these um, movements in the West. So, um, what, you know, however way you describe them, uh, what is the fact? Well, the fact is that since 1990, uh, these uh, parties uh, have been part of 17 coalition governments um, in, you know, in, in Europe. So either they were active participants in that given coalition government, or they lent their external backing. They weren't a part of it, but they gave external support to the existing um, cabinets, okay, minority cabinets. And um, so this means that they're not going anywhere. You know, wh wh however way you're going to define them, whether you throw them all into the same basket, take them off, scatter them, do whatever you want, put them into the blender, they're permanent players. They're not going anywhere. And uh, and you might ask the question, okay, you know, permanent players. So what? So are the green parties? So are the social democrats? You know, it's like you know, conservative parties. Why should we get concerned about these particular parties? Well, they matter because according to some authors, uh, they pose the greatest risk to European democracies. So um, they really uh, are, you know, have a very detrimental effect on democracies. This is why they're not just any political player out there, if you will. So um, as I, you know, as here is another um, picture of the rise of nationalism in Europe. As I said, um, it is all over the place. It's not just endemic to one region or one country. Um, and um, some of them, of course, are more dramatic than others. For instance, here in the picture, the dark green part refers to Austria with Austria Freedom Party taking 26% of the votes. Um, let's say as opposed to Cyprus, where you know it's it's Elam only got 3.7% of the votes, or Greece Golden Dawn got 7% of the votes. So um, these parties, as we said, they're very much against immigration. They have a very anti-immigrant tone. So um, you know what's going on on the side of uh, you know Europe uh, when it comes to immigrants? Like what is you know uh, what what is the density, if you will, of immigration to Europe? Um, so you know some some graph as I have you know, as I have on the scene from 2017, uh, taken from Eurostat, um, tells us that um, actually um, this is not as much as we think. Um, they're not, you know, um, the, the, let's say, per thousand inhabitant distribution of immigrants are not as dense as we think in most places. For instance, uh, let's find out Austria. Austria here is, uh, let me see, Malta, Luxembourg, Cyprus, Ireland, Sweden, Estonia, Austria. Austria, you know, has several countries ahead of it when it comes to immigrants per thousand inhabitants. Uh, and yet it is not, you know, it is, you know, it's, it's, it's not the highest on this list, even though despite the percentage of votes that the far right party in that country received. So there are some, you know, paradoxical things here that we need to go over. 
Um, also, um, Switzerland on the far right, if you look at this picture, you're going to, you know, it's, it's, it's on the far right because these are outside the EU 28. Um, so um, Switzerland also is, is, you know, is not among the highest of, uh, you know, density when it comes to immigrants. Uh, but uh, Switzerland has actually one of the uh, most persistent far-right parties in Europe, which, as we will discuss later, a few studies have really um, discussed in detail, which is rather interesting. So you do have, you do have some paradoxes related to uh, these parties, as well as um, yes. the density of immigrants in these settings. Okay, so having stated that, so keep that, you know, picture, you know, that graphic in mind. I hope you kept it in mind. So let's move on to this one. Where have far right parties had most success in Europe? So, um, as I said, a lot of country, you know, a lot of cities, as we will see on far right politics, they concentrate on what's going on in places like, um, you know, in, in Germany or in, in, in France or UK, in West Europe in general. Uh, which is fine, but they're really uh, missing what's going on in Eastern Europe and the Balkans. So, uh, for instance, Law and Justice po Party in Poland in 2019 got 43% six, 43.6% uh, of the of the votes, which is you know pretty big when you think about it. And again, I repeat, the Swiss People's Party. I mean, everyone associates Switzerland as this you know idyllic country with little going on, almost no um, you know nothing extraordinary. You know, it's almost a little bit dull, if you will. But then you know, um, think again, because Swiss People's Party in Switzerland in 2019 received 25% six of the votes. You know, it's like that's. That's pretty big when you think about it. Okay. And then the third place, uh, you know, goes to Jobbik. Jobbik, I don't know how to pronounce it. I, I don't speak Hungarian, but this is in Hungary in 2018. This is 19.1%, followed, uh, you know, closely by the Swedish, you know, Sweden Democrats. Again, 2018 result is 17.5%. And, you know, uh, led by Liga Lord. Nord in Italy in 2018. So Italy on this list is one, two, three, four, fifth. So it's it's fifth ranking, and it's almost neck to neck race, I would say, with the Swedish ones. So they're almost I would I I might dare say that they're tied, almost like the fourth slash fifth place, followed by the Freedom Party of Austria, 16.2. Vox in Spain by 15.1. This is from 2019. Front National in France, 2017 is 13.2%. Alternative for Germany as like 12.6%. This is from 2017. And UK is UKIP 1.8%. Again, these are the latest results, uh, but we also have um, the time, let's say, spread. Of, of what's going on in these countries when it comes to um, when, when it comes to anti-immigration parties. Um, so as you can see, certain countries have had almost consistent rise, um, you know, in, in years, such as Germany. I mean, Germany doesn't look uh, like it's as dramatic, let's say, as Austria, but it's 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 you know it has some dips, but mostly speaking, it's consistent. And then there are also interesting cases like Portugal, where it's almost like a flat line. And then Norway started out with, you know, kind of static, uh, you know, outlook. And then, you know, it's, it's, it, it took a dip, but then it has been persistent in, in the, you know, in its, uh, let's say, in its position when it comes to anti-immigration parties. And Sweden, of course, uh, it has shown almost a steady rise, uh, which is, rather worrisome. So um, who votes for these parties? You know, you, me, my grandma, well, she can't because she passed away, but you know, here is an interesting tidbit. We know um, there is a gender gap when it comes to supporting or voting for these parties. In fact, apparently this is a chronic problem for them. Uh, what is the chronic problem? It turns out that uh, males tend to men I tend to vote for these parties more than women. Uh, well, this is okay, nice, but well, I don't, I mean, it's a finding, but here's the paradox. You, we also have some prominent far right party female leaders here. So, um, you know, I put their names down there. So on the left, you have Alice Weidel from Germany, 
in the middle you have Marine Le Pen from France and Giorgio Meloni from Italy. So, you know, all these three ladies, what do they have in common? They're all three ladies, attractive, I guess being blonde is part of the job description. Uh, but uh, when it comes to voter base, um, they're not getting as much result from women um, as, and, and they really would like to, um, you know, mobilize women uh, more uh, if they could. Uh, so, um, but we know still know little about the impact of women in far right politics. What, what kind of a role do they play? I mean, they do have a leadership role at, at the top, yes. But when, when it comes to average voters like you and me, um, do they have a role? What is their role? So we don't know yet. So um, another fact is that, um, you know, a lot of people may not be aware of this, but um, it turns out that more studies exist on far right parties than any other party families as we speak. So if you're going to get into this literature, um, like you're going to, there's more literature available on far right parties compared to like, let's say social Democrats on Christian, you know, um, Democrats or on, on liberal parties, you know, green parties, blah, blah, blah. You get the idea. Okay. And um, one of the reasons why this, this happens is because, uh, as I said, uh, the definitions are used fluidly. It's they're they're put into the same basket. So, you know, far right, extreme right, extremist political parties, they're all put into the same uh, basket, in addition to, of course, anti what, what is called as anti-immigration parties. And, uh, and nowadays, you also have, uh, you know, populist parties being included in this list for good or for bad. So this is, this might be another, you know, this might be a reason why um, you see um, a lot, a lot more studies on these movements than, you know, um, compared to the other available party families out there. Um, so it, on the one hand, you could say that, okay, this makes sense because it's not like uh, these parties came into existence yesterday. They've been around for many, many decades. Um, it's, it's not a new phenomenon at all. Um, and in fact, uh, MUD found out that these uh, parties, they rise and retreat in waves. So they, they, they rise and retreat in waves, which is kind of reminiscent in a way to the democratization patterns uh, that are you know, discussed by people like um, you know, Sam Huntington. Um, so um, just, you know, for those people who took my courses, uh, we discussed this. So just like, you know, uh, democratization waves in the world, as well as, you know, counter democratization, if you will, uh, reverse uh, democratization waves, uh, you know, put up, you know, discussed by people like Samuel Huntington, apparently extremist parties in Europe, they also come and go in waves. So um, talking about this literature again, um, as I said, as I said at the beginning of my lecture, I want to talk about you know a little bit about this literature because, as I said, our perceptions are pretty much shaped by what we see around us as as well as what we read. And this is the literature. This is what we read. So let's find out what they have to say or what they look like. So here, as you can see, um, you know, Casmod took uh, the the studies between 1970 and 2010. And uh, this top uh, blue um, squiggly line refers to extreme radical right wing populist right far right parties all in the same basket. The red line here again, if you can see it, it refers to the Christian Democratic parties. As you can see, they're really small compared. It's it's they're dwarfed. I would say all these other studies they're dwarfed by extreme radical right wing uh, party studies. You know, social democratic parties, they have the same similar fate with the Christian democratic parties, as well as green parties. I find this really fascinating uh, because, um, because when you think about it, uh, we still consider uh, these parties to be in the minority. I mean, right, you know, I mean, they're not the so-called majority. How can we have so much literature on a bunch of parties that are not even considered to be major? Um, and, and, and main, you know, mainstream political parties. So, you know, uh, this is a question to ask. Hold on, my, hmm, I'm clicking. Okay, so yes. So I say, you know, uh, well, I didn't say, but Cass Mudd says this. Uh, so these parties come and go in waves and the, the literature also that studies them, um, you know, you can divide them into at least three waves. 
and he puts the first wave um, from the period between 1945 and 1980. Here, during this period, he says that mostly historians wrote about these parties, these movements, and therefore their general focus was historical. And they weren't really that much interested in scientific findings, but their studies mostly were descriptive in nature. And they also were interested in the historical events that revolved around World War II and, you know, after its, its aftermath and, and also the Cold War developments, if you will. Starting from 1980 to 2000, the second wave comes in. Here you have, uh, you know, the entry of social sciences, political scientists, sociologists, anthropologists, you name it. Um, and uh, the, let's say uh, the fashionable uh, model that is used uh, in this wave is the modernization theories. Uh, we will be, I will be discussing them in a second. Um, my students uh, who are taking, you know, who are in this lecture right now might remember this because we discussed it in class. And um, he says that, uh, you know, during this time, this literature was pretty much influenced by what was written in the US, in North America, but especially in the US on the radical right. And this goes to, he says, uh, 1960s works at the time. So the European literature, uh, what was written for Europe was also influenced by the theoretical framework and the discussions uh, by um, these um, theories, uh, you know, during that period, which also, again, I think is rather interesting because Paolo talks about the legal, um, you know, the, the legal European legal framework um, taking or taking a page from the US practices and, and, and approaches. So I guess um, our field is not that different when it comes to studying far right parties. Uh, apparently they took um, some of the arguments there or at least the, the general approach of uh, North American writers uh, it, during this wave. And what is the leading research question at the time? Um, during wave two up until 2000, I know um, researchers were mostly interested in explaining the success of you know far right parties. Why you know do they even exist? How come they get so many votes? What's up with them? And this is why they these studies were also interested in what he calls as the demand side of far right politics. Why are these you know why are these parties in demand? Why do people want them? Why do people vote for them? Okay. And here in this case, the far right parties were the dependent variable. So, you know, it was put into this framework that, you know, voters ask for them. As a result, the far right the far, far right parties come into existence. Okay, so that was the causality, if you will, um, let's say, um, direction. Okay. And uh, as a result, he says, uh, during this, it was also during this period that a lot of literature uh, was produced with uh, problematic secondary data. So you have plenty of data, but they weren't necessarily uh, reliable or they didn't give consistent results. So um, the third wave. Um, so um, I think I got the time wrong. So that should read uh, from 2000 onwards, I apologize. Um, so the focus here shifts the supply side of far right politics. So at the beginning, you know, in the previous slide during the second, um, you know, wave, uh, the, the political far right political parties were the result of a demand that came from the public. They were asking for it and boom, you got the result uh, in the form of these extreme parties. But then here it's, it's, it's the, the whole uh, viewpoint is flipped. Now they're looking at the supply side and they're trying to explain the electoral outcomes, you know, in the form of again, successes. And what happens as a result? Do they come into power? Do they try to change policies? What exactly do they do, these parties? And as a result, you could say that methodologically speaking, far right parties in, during wave three, they're treated as both dependent and independent variables, okay? And it is also important that this became a topic that was no longer, you know, um, studied by a bunch of eccentric scholars huddled together, just, you know, two or three people with, you know, nobody else hearing about them. It's just a niche study. No, this became a very mainstream study. As I said, there are tons of literature produced on this. In fact, it far surpassed the other so-called normal, um, you know, mainstream political parties out there. So um, as I said earlier, um, 
in, in the existing um, body of literature on far right parties so far, if we're talking about Europe, um, the focus remains on West European states, what goes on in West European states, mostly this could be Germany, France, UK, so forth. We have less information, there is an information gap on, you know, places in places like Sweden, Denmark, Switzerland, okay, which is actually ironic because apparently, as I've shown you the electoral results of these parties in those countries, they're actually doing better in those countries where they're studied less. So I think that's a paradox. And I think it has a lot to do with our perceptions of these parties, as well as the historical baggage. I mean, for instance, everyone's going to pay attention to Germany because of the historical baggage that Germany carries uh, for obvious reasons. So this is why even if, you know, let's say the rise of far right parties in Germany is less dramatic, let's say in, in, in Switzerland, uh, people are going to pay more attention to Germany. And um, still, uh, we have emerging studies on Central and Eastern Europe. So uh, these are focusing on certain, um, you know, uh, movements, parties there. So we have the Jobbik Jobbik, again, I'm massacring the name of the party, the Movement for a Better Hungary, um, the Slovak National Party, Ataka Party, which literally means, I guess, attack in Bulgaria, and uh, the League of Polish Families Party in Poland. So uh, it's like this is uh, the Jobbik uh, gathering. Uh, please note the armbands. That's, oh, it's actually pretty uh, repulsive, I always say. And here, I don't speak Bulgarian, but I think this, like, I can read here something to do with Siganska, Drzava, or something like that. It's like Niska. So it's like something like we don't want gypsies or something like that, I guess. So it's, it's as we said, it's, it's quite xenophobic and, um, and racist, um, you know, as, as we can see here. So um, on the one hand, it's great if you're becoming a researcher on doing a research on um, these parties, please pay attention to these new and, you know, places where, you know, not much is known, such as Eastern Europe or Balkans. On the other hand, um, one of the reasons why scholars have kept away from these regions, aside from the linguistic difficulties, obviously, is because they had a roller coaster, what he calls, uh, Mud calls as the roller coaster party performance. Um, you know, uh, Sto Stoyarova, Vera Stoyarova, Stoyarova, I'm sorry, I apologize, um, wrote a very um, interesting book from, you know, uh, published in 2013. And I took this, um, you know, um, this, this figure from her book. So, um, so he, she, she put the performance of, uh, you know, a uh, percent vote share of the leading, uh, you know, far right parties in the region. And as you can see, a lot of them are, you know, some of them are steady, you know, uh, but a lot of them, as you can see, uh, they're zigzagging. So for instance, if you're SRS, uh, which is the Serbian Radical Party, that's like a huge dip when you think about it. Or um, in this case, uh, there is PRM, uh, which is, hold on, PRM. So that's, where is it? Let's see. Yes, the Greater Romania Party. So that's, again, you know, a huge dip here. Um, so, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's, it's, it's very, it's not consistent, which makes it difficult to interpret and difficult to study, I guess, okay? And also the third uh, wave studies, uh, in addition to their narrow focus on Western Europe, uh, they have mostly focused on immigration, on ethnic minorities, and on, you know, the fact that most of these, um, most of these parties have a very distant, uh, let's say, um, they, they, they dislike uh, European integration as a whole on principle. So, um, as I said earlier, the first, second waves of the written literature on the topic are mostly qualitative, descriptive. They don't have much of a research design because they were uh, designed by uh, historians or social scientists uh, that weren't that much uh, fixated on the scientific version of, um, you know, studies, if you will. And um, the wave three, the third wave is different in that sense that uh, these studies already dominate the field on party studies. And uh, you also have a big increase in the number of studies, quantitative studies that use secondary data. So if you're into this, if you're gonna you know, study these topics, then there are some data sets that are available on parties. So we can talk about the comparative manifesto project and the Chapel Hill expert survey. 
And, uh, and in, you know, forthcoming in 2021, there is the University of Oslo um, initiative, the C-Rex Center for Research on Extremism. They say that they're gonna start publishing their results in 2021. So if you're keen on, you know, keeping up with the studies, I suggest that you, you know, check into them. Um, meanwhile, um, qualitative methods are very much, um, they're very much valued in this field because they give you some very in-depth results. And normally uh, their results are more robust simply because uh, the researchers spend a lot more time uh, you know, talking to people, just getting really immersed into the surroundings of what goes on and so forth. Uh, but because they're time consuming and because it's sometimes difficult to uh, penetrate into these groups, um, qualitative methods are not as much used nowadays um, in these studies as um, quantitative studies. So I promised you a couple of slides ago that uh, modernization theories still prevail in the field. So they became prevalent during the second wave. Uh, they didn't go um, to a lot, you know, they didn't go too far in the third wave either. What exactly is modernization theories? So um, in a nutshell, basically the modernization theories um, were developed after the second world war. They argue that if you have, you know, uh, the more countries industrialize, urbanize, the, the more they, get, you know, gather wealth and the more they educate their population, the more they're going to have um, socioeconomic development, which will lead to open class system and large middle classes. And large middle classes are valuable because according to this theory, it's going to lead to democratic transition and stability. Okay. So um, all is nice and good, but uh, the problem here is that um, in these studies, uh, they didn't really study economic crises um, as a factor, as, as a possible um, influential factor in, um, in the voting uh, patterns for these, uh, for, for these parties. And um, so uh, more studies are pretty much needed on the impact of economic crisis as a whole. So, um, now let's move on to the, uh, you know, the impact of far right parties and their impact on immigration debates in Europe. So um, the general understanding is that far right parties increase uh, the, you know, the far right speed, far right parties uh, politicize immigration in Europe is the general argument there. And they, 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 they play a key role in tightening policies on immigration and asylum. And uh, they increase the votes cast for extreme views, they, you know, encourage polarization in societies, and of course they exacerbate xenophobia. Um, so how, ex what exactly do we mean by politicization? Well, politicization is basically, uh, you start out as something, you know, apolitical about an issue. Let's say that this is animal rights, okay, or women's rights. You're apolitical, you don't have an opinion, you're just, nah, you know, just, you know, neutral on the issue. And then, you know, uh, by politicization here in this literature, we mean that this particular issue, it could be women's rights, it could be animals' rights, it could be immigration, whatever it is, it becomes a contentious or controversial um, topic, you know, a bone of contention, if you will, between, you know, conflicting parties. So uh, Vanderberg et al. in 2015, they came up with, let's say, an explanation uh, that explains the process of politicization of immigration in European countries. They say that four possible paths exist in theory uh, for countries to approach, uh, you know, the, the politicization process regarding immigration. So this could also either be a top-down process, okay, where, you know, you're the state institutions, you're the official organizations, and you you know, generate this thing. You initiate the whole process of politicization on the society you know, over which you have control. Or it could be a bottom up process based, you know, informed by the grassroots, okay? So the grassroots movements, the civil society makes demands to the policy makers. And as a result, policy makers respond to this and by politicizing the issue. Of course, in this case, you also have to consider the structure of agents. So, you know, here there are a bunch of actors that are available, such as political parties, it could be social elites, civil society members, you name it. And um, here um, they put, um, they summarize, if you will, this whole structure in these two, um, you know, in, in, in this figure and table. On the one hand, you could have, you know, this is, let's say, on the topic of immigration, you could have on the left side agreement, 
all parties, you know, all parts, all actors can agree on it, or all, you know, there is total disagreement on it. And um, the salience of the issue is that, you know, the issue is really regarded as important, pressing, otherwise vital, or, you know, not salient, meaning it's just not one of the more pressing concerns, you know, it's there, but it's, it doesn't need to be pro prioritized. And based on where, which part of, you know, which side you're on, um, then, you know, a country could find itself falling into one of the four quadrants, um, you know, concerning the politicization of immigration. Okay, so again, here, a structure and agency also plays an important role. Again, if this is initiated from the top to down, uh, then uh, the structure that's going to come up is going to be a political opportunity structure and uh, authorities uh, such as established parties or, or the ones in charge, they're going to initiate this process. If this is a process that is initiated from the bottoms up, you know, such as, as we said, grassroots movements and so forth, they're going to be, you know, the structure is going to be uh, shaped by societal developments. And there could be actions of specific groups. So this could be, you know, come up in the form of new parties getting established, or it could be in the expressions of civil society actors, numerous, you know, whichever one are they are. So um, what about the impact of recent immigration waves? I've talked about at the beginning of my presentation about um, the impact of the Syrian war, for instance, on, um, on, on the European voting behavior. So there is this study from Dinas et al. from 2019. They found that there is a positive link between exposure to immigrants in a state and a tendency to vote for far right parties. So this was a finding that they found. Um, but there is this earlier study by Alonso and Fonseca who found, that, found out that you know, these parties may not be that influential when it comes to the voting behavior of people uh, for center-right parties. So um, the, in other words, it's arguing that you know, um, center-right party voters may not be that much affected by the far-right parties' um, discussions, if you will, of the issue. But then, you know, there are two studies by Steinmeier um, conducted for, uh, uh, you know, uh, within the framework of Austria. And um, this was a pretty intensive study. He did two studies. And the first one from 2017, he found out that, first of all, immigrant voter exposure. So if, in other words, if voters are exposed to immigrants and depending on how long they're exposed to them, this is going to have an impact on their voting behavior. We know this for a fact. So this is not a null hypothesis. There is definitely you know, a, a, a relationship between the two. And from 2016, he says that the exposure to refugees in Austria has an impact on the, I'm quoting from him, support for far-right nationalist anti-immigration parties. And he says that exposure to refugees in that setting decreased the support for the extremist party of Austria, the Freedom Party of Austria, by 4.42%. Um, now, how about unemployment rates, okay? And voting for these parties, do they have an impact? Okay, um, so here uh, we could say that in Europe, uh, the, you know, those increases in unemployment rates would be closely correlated with increases in both support for populist or anti-establishment parties and with declining trust in political institutions. So this is a finding from Brookings Institute, okay? And uh, this is, I took their, um, their graph, uh, which uh, they summarized their findings uh, from uh, 2000s uh, to 2017, okay? And uh, the blue dots refer to the south, the red ones represent the center, and the green ones, you know, refer to north. And those, you know, the tan colored ones refer to the ones in transition. Again, um, when we talk about, you know, and, you know, voting for these far right parties and, um, and, and immigrants and, uh, and economy, is there a link? Uh, there is another study by Halle, Wagner, and Zweimüller from 2015. They, they, they basically give three uh, factors here. The three factors are geographic proximity, type of immigration, 
and total number of immigrants. So it's not just any exposure and it's not just any type of immigration that's going to lead, that's going to affect uh, the voting behavior of, um, of, of, of the people. So in other words, people are not indifferent to different forms of immigration. In fact, they argue that their findings state that the proximity of low and medium skilled immigrants uh, caused Austrian voters to turn to the far right. Um, in uh, the contrary, you know, contrary to this, high skilled immigration did not have a significant or, you know, effect on, or, or it had a negative effect on the far right party votes. So in other words, um, these, uh, you know, people, uh, let's say with, let's say they, they don't have, let's say that if you're not a high skilled um, worker, you know, in Austria, then uh, if you have low skills or medium skills, then you're likelier to vote in, you know, in response to the immigrants issue, you're likelier to vote for the far right party than, you know, if you're a high skilled, let's say, you know, academic, uh, you know, it's like uh, scholars and doctors and, you know, you get the idea. So th th those kind of people, if you're a high scale, a skilled uh, worker, then you, you don't have, you know, this, you know, this is not going to influence the, uh, the far right party votes. One thing, so one general finding that they found, Hala Wagner and Zweimler, were that, in other words, um, the effects of immigration, if we are talking about the negative effects of immigration, this is not just on the labor market. So, you know, I have high skills, I'm medium skilled, and therefore I'm responding to it. No, it's not only that, but it also is related to the value of the neighborhood of the people that they live in. So one of the concerns of the people is that, oh, I have immigrants in my region. So will the value of my house, my land, my whatever, is it going to drop in value? This is, by the way, a topic that is also discussed in studies um, in North America. So this is why, you know, Cass Mudd, in my previous slides, I said that a lot of this literature uh, picks up, uh, you know, its cues from the literature that was produced um, on, on these movements and on, 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 you know, racism and whatnot that was, um, that was produced for North America earlier, okay? And uh, I'm quoting from these people before I move on. In communities with larger immigration influx, Austrian children commute longer distances to school and fewer daycare resources are provided. We do not find evidence that Austrians move out of communities with increasing immigrant presence. So um, the, again, uh, the labor market is influential. The value of the neighborhood is influential. Uh, one of the reasons why people are worried about the value of their neighborhood is because it could be possible that um, you know, uh, they don't want to send their kids um, to, 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 to the same school as the immigrants um, for whatever reason. Um, another study from 2014 um, said that there are comparative studies on Br British, French, and Italian governments during 2000s. And uh, they found out that far right parties have a measurable impact on the for policy formation on immigration. So this is not just empty words. This is not just fluff. Actually, these people have a have an impact on a you know measurable impact on policy making on immigration, and uh, Minkenberg, um, however, he says he puts a nuance to this. He says that entering the parliament is not going to lead to automatic policy effects when we're talking about far right you know um, parties. It's not like when they enter into a parliament, they're going to you know automatically going to start affecting. Uh, policy making, but they are going to have an impact on the so-called the cultural policies of their countries. This is, you know, something that you can definitely measure. So now um, I like this uh, picture because it pretty much uh, this cartoon uh, pretty much summarizes all the um, I would say uh, the prejudices that people have concerning mainstream parties. You know, a lot of people associate mainstream parties and innocent ones, you know, here populist parties trying to steal votes while the mainstream parties are, you know, are dealing with all the real problems and whatnot. You know, is this true? Is this really this, the whole, you know, the thing? Uh, let's, let's see, let's see. So um, Bale wrote an influential uh, article in 2003 in, um, in, in West European politics journal. 
And um, and uh, I like his uh, the title of his article. Cinderella and his uh, you know her ugly sisters was the you know is is the title of this article. I think it's hilarious. Anyway, so he says that actually far right parties have an indirect but long term effect on party systems. So he's looking at the impact on not just policy making but on the whole structure, party structure itself. You know, system systemic effects, if you will, in the long run. And he says that far right parties affect the political opportunity structure for European mainstream parties, not just any parties, but mainstream parties, the so called regular average parties. So, and he says, this is, I think, the gist of the argument there. Center right parties, he found, utilized the new structures here, the political opportunity structures, and these people, these parties to gain majority. So, in other words, what the center right parties in most settings did, according to the findings of Bale, was that they would selectively use um, the, the, the themes that are brought up by the far right parties, just like you know what you know left wing parties did for green parties back, you know, back in the earlier days. Okay. And in a way, by selective utilization of these far right themes, because this was done by the center right parties, they actually legitimized, they helped to legitimize the issues that were brought up by these far right parties. And therefore, they gave them an importance, a salience, which was which might have been otherwise lacking. Okay. And this also, you know, and, and they did, why did they do this? Are they mean? No, because they just wanted to increase their importance. They wanted to remain relevant. And they also, you know, these mainstream parties, the center right parties, they wanted to, you know, to maintain or increase their seats. And once in power, this is the interesting thing, center right parties adopted, you know, an uncompromising stance on immigration. So a lot of people think that it is the far right parties that propagate these things, but actually center right parties, you know, after, you know, selectively picking on these, you know, um, themes, they also became uh, pretty uncom uncompromising on immigration issues. So, um, so this previous picture is not necessarily um, correct. The, the guy to the uh, left, the mainstream parties are not really as innocent as they um, seem. And um, a study by Grandi et al. similarly found out that far right parties do not always monopolize the politicization process, um, but they also, uh, you know, affect um, the, you know, they they affect the politicization of immigration process. They don't have to monopolize it, but they they can affect the outcome, you know, by nudging things in the right direction. And another study by Ackerman found out that there are visible policy differences between center left center leading governments and you know far right parties but the far right parties um, you know uh, differences are not that visible when it comes to center right leading governments so uh, the the distance is less than uh, we think so um far right parties and the voter perceptions um, is there a link between the two? Um, the impact of far right parties and um, you know the perceptions of voters. There is a study by Halwig and Quion uh, that was undertaken for Western Europe. One of the you know one of the countries under question was the Netherlands. They found out that elites affect the popular views on immigration. Immigration was defined as a complex issue, and they figured out that elites affect the views there. And importantly. You know, what is interesting, I think I found it to be interesting at least, is that the elites influence not just people who are illiterate or with a low education and stuff, but actually elites, um, you know, influence are, you know, can be seen more on people with better education when it comes to complex issues, which I think was quite paradoxical, the finding, but there you go. And again, uh, party positions, uh, Brenciano, maybe I'm massacring them probably, and Lashot also found out that party positions on immigration is going to influence the attitude of voters, the tone, the way they set the whole thing. And, um, and you know, um, and again, similar study from Netherlands and Sweden by Hartveld et al. found out that, you know, voters are influenced by their parties, what they say on, you know, on, on immigration or on whatever uh, they consider to be salient. 
So um, as a result, voters support anti or pro immigration parties, which leads to the radicalization of the whole debate and which uh, you know, fuels the increasing polarization in European societies. And um, you know, uh, one final thing is that here you have to understand that um, politicization of immigrants, the whole issue, if you will, depends on the local administrations as well, you know, how they approach and manage the issue. Actually, this was also brought, brought up by in the previous slides by Steinmeier on Austria. It was also, you know, it's, it's, it's also one of the findings that he had. So he, you know, and the bets at all, uh, based on uh, this uh, study on Turkey, um, Lebanon, and one more country, I forgot, but um, those were the two countries at least. You know, they found out that local administrations, or, and such as you know, actors like mayors, they can become ultimate arbiters to mobilize or refrain from sharing their limited resources and uh, towards immigrants, what's, what's available to them. And this is um, going to affect um, you know, the politicization po process of immigrants as a whole in that given society. Okay. So um, before I conclude, you know, this is my concluding statement. What are the remaining gaps in the literature? Um, apparently, we still don't know enough about the ideology, the leaders, the members. Remember my um, slides on the females and uh, an organization um, structure, organizational structure of, of, of several uh, emerging parties uh, in, in you know, comparative studies, you know, they are lacking, you know, such as we don't know a lot about the Danish People's Party, the Finns, the Progress Party, and of course the Swiss People's Party. I can't believe why it's not, it's so understudied really. Um, and these parties definitely deserve certain, you know, further study. Um, you know, uh, definitely regions like Eastern Europe and the Balkans deserve uh, more focus. And uh, most parties still are understudied. And uh, again, um, there are parties in Estonia, Bulgaria, and Latvia that could use uh, more discussion. So um, thank you very much for putting up uh, with so long with my ongoing you know, droning about the far right parties. I hope you benefited from the information that I gave you.